Greetings, Nursing 311 students. We're going to start with Chapter 24, Communication in Nursing. Communication is a powerful therapeutic tool and an essential nursing skill that influences others and achieves positive health outcomes. In working with patients and their families, healthcare professionals must communicate effectively to convey care plans and apply nursing skills and knowledge. When performing their professional duties, nurses will be required to use nonverbal, verbal, and technological skills to communicate with patients, families, and other healthcare professionals. Nurses cannot function without communicating with these patients, family members, and other healthcare professionals. Oftentimes, nurses communicate with others under extreme stress. It is very important that nurses be assertive so they can ask the correct questions and their voices can be heard, especially when acting as their patient's advocate. Competent communication will help you maintain effective relationships within the profession and meet legal, ethical, and clinical standards of care. Breakdown in communication among healthcare teams is a major cause of errors in the workplace, threatens professional credibility, and can be life-threatening to patients. Your therapeutic relationship will begin when you first meet your patient. The first eye contact and first interaction will set the stage for you and your patient and family members. Gaining experience in communication requires that you learn and use communication theory and also draw on past personal experiences. You will need to interpret messages received from others, analyze the content, make inferences about the meaning, evaluate the effect, explain the rationale for the technique used, and examine communication styles and patterns. Effective interpersonal communication is essential to provide safe transitions and care. Effective communication is critical in promoting collaboration and teamwork in providing patient-centered care. For more information, please review Box 24.1 and 24.2 on page 311. Every nuance of posture, every small expression and gesture, every word chosen, every attitude held, all have the potential to hurt or heal. Respect the potential power of communication and do not carelessly misuse communication to hurt, manipulate, or coerce others. Nurses with expertise in communication express caring by becoming sensitive to self and others. By self-exploration, knowing their own attitudes, biases, examining that closely, and questioning that, promoting and accepting the expression of positive and negative feelings, not shying away from a patient if they start to talk about negative things, not changing the subject when negative feelings come up. Nurses develop helping trusting relationships. They instill faith and hope in their clients. They promote interpersonal teaching and learning. They provide a supportive environment, assisting with gratification of human needs and also allowing for spiritual expression. Nurses who develop critical thinking skills make the best communicators. They draw on theoretical knowledge about communication and integrate this knowledge with knowledge previously learned through personal experience. Perseverance and creativity are also helpful because they motivate a nurse to identify innovative solutions. Patients respond more readily to a self-confident attitude. Colleagues sometimes question suggestion, suggestions in nursing interventions. Having confidence in yourself will help you speak up and offer new ideas. An attitude of fairness goes a long way in the ability to listen to both sides in any discussion, as well as a non-judgmental attitude. Integrity allows nurses to recognize when their opinions conflict with others and those of their patients. You won't know everything. Having an attitude of humility is necessary to recognize and communicate the need for more information before making a decision. Communication is most effective when the receiver and the sender accurately perceive the meaning of one another's message. It is challenging to understand human communication within interpersonal relationships. Each person's biases, understanding of a situation through the filter of his or her senses, and his or her life experiences, culture, education, and past events. 
Perceptual biases are human tendencies that interfere with accurately perceiving and interpreting messages from others. People often assume that others think, feel, act, react, and behave as they would in a similar circumstance. They tend to distort or ignore information that goes against their expectations, preconceptions, or stereotypes. You can overcome perceptual bias by thinking critically, which will help you control these tendencies and communicate effectively. Please look over this table and memorize these levels of communication. Intrapersonal, one that occurs within an individual. Interpersonal, one-on-one -on -one interaction between two people. Transpersonal communication is interaction within a person's spiritual domain. Small group communication is obviously interaction with a small number of people and public communication is interacting with a larger group or audience. Here's a quiz. What did we say? Intrapersonal? B. Occurring within an individual. Interpersonal? A. One-to-one -one interaction between two people. Transpersonal? D. Interaction within a person's spiritual domain. Small group? An easy match, E, interaction with a small number of people. In public, C, interaction with an audience. Quick quiz. You are invited to attend the weekly unit patient care conference. The staff discusses patient care issues. This type of communication is public, interpersonal, transpersonal, or small group. Answer is D, small group. A staff meeting. This busy slide represents Communication 101. Some of you might recognize this from your communication class. It is quite complex. If we look at the stimulus can also be called the referent. It's the reason for the interaction or the motivation for communication. So the sender has a referent or a motivation to communicate. They have many influences, which are, you can review in the box below the sender column. The sender uses a message to send information. It can be verbal, nonverbal, it can be written. And then you look at the transmission quality. So that message is going to the receiver, who also has personal filters listed under that column. The receiver will interpret that message, formulate feedback, and give feedback back to the sender. This model represents a very complex process. The sender and the receiver's physical and developmental status, perceptions, values, emotions, knowledge, socio-cultural background, roles, and environment all influence message transmission. Further reference can be found on figure 24-1 from text page 312, 312. If we want to look at the five variables, or actually there's seven listed here, elements in the process of communication, we talked about these, the referent, is what motivates one to communicate with another, so the reason why we're communicating. The sender and the receiver are the encoders and the decoders of the message. And the message is the content, channels, the way that the message is conveyed. Feedback is when the receiver returns a message. There's also interpersonal variables to consider factors that influence communication within oneself, and the environment can affect the process of communication. So the setting that people are in. Okay, quick quiz. We said the reference, the referent was D, the motivation to communicate with one with another person. Two, the sender and receiver was the encoder and the decoder of the message. Three, 
G, the content was the message. Four, the channel. E, the means of conveying and receiving messages. Five, the feedback. C, the message the receiver returned. Six, interpersonal variables. F, those are the factors that influence communication, the personal factors. And seven, environment is the setting. The next slide is kind of a more simpler version of what we just talked about. So communication, how much is verbal and how much is nonverbal? Look at the nonverbal percentage there. So you've heard the term, it's not what you said, it's how you said it. And this really well illustrates these percentages. So we have to remember what we look like as we give the message. When you're doing later on, we're gonna talk about an exercise called process recording, where we put down both verbal and nonverbal communication from us and the nonverbal and verbal communication we get back via feedback from our patient. And we pay attention and we use all of our senses in exploring what's going on both verbally and nonverbally. Communication involves two symbols. The spoken word represents the public self and it can be straightforward or can be used to distort, conceal, deny, or disguise true feelings. And then our nonverbal behaviors, which convey a wide range of human activities from body movements to responses to the message of others. Sometimes these are conflicting, so we get a mixed message or a double message. A double bind message may be given. In a double bind message, one thing may be said, but the tone or the body language actually is the opposite or different. So the it's a no-win situation. The intent is to create confusion. Sure, go ahead and have a good time. Don't worry about me. I'll just be home studying. So verbal communication, what does that entail? Yes, it includes spoken or written words. It also is the vocabulary we choose. In healthcare, it's important to use layman's terms and not medical terminology, which could make some people feel uncomfortable or they may not understand what we're talking about. They may be too sick to articulate that they don't understand. So we really need to be careful in the vocabulary we choose. We also need to be aware of denotative and connotative meanings. Denotative meanings is a dictionary definition of a word, but connotation refers to a meaning that is implied by a word apart from the thing which it describes explicitly. Words can carry cultural and emotional associations or meanings in addition to their literal meanings or denotations. For instance, Wall Street literally means a street situated in Lower Manhattan, but connotatively it refers to wealth and power. There may be positive and negative connotations to certain words. For example, the words childish, childlike, and youthful have the same denotative but different connotative meanings. Childish and childlike have a negative connotation as they refer to immature behavior of a person, whereas youthful implies that a person is lively and energetic. A few ex more examples are a dog connotates shame, uh, shamelessness or an ugly face. A dove implies peace or gentility. Home suggests family, comfort, and security. Politician has a negative connotation of wickedness and insincerity, insincerity while statesperson connotates sincerity. Pushy refers to someone loudmouthed and irritating. Mom and dad, when used in the place of mother and father, connotate loving parents. However, depending on the background of someone, that could have a negative connotation. Remember your timing and your pacing. If you're working with someone, you have to work slow enough for them to understand what you're saying. If you're teaching something new, the pace may be slowed. Rather, if you're reviewing something someone 
someone already knows, you can go a little bit faster. Intonation. Interestingly enough, in our language, we do have tonal variation, but in some languages, tones mean a lot more. Well, we do have a natural cadence to our tones in this language. We just have to be aware that we want to make something interesting instead of being monotone. Good morning, Mr. Jones. Here is your medication. So we'd rather have appropriate tones using, good morning, Mr. Jones. Here's your medication. There also may be times where we really need to have clarity and brevity. So if somebody is anxious, if somebody is in pain, they don't want to sit and chat or hear a long drawn out explanation of something that's going to happen. So we have to pay attention to the right timing, clarity, brevity, and making things relevant. Most important, make sure your communication is culturally competent and respectful. What about nonverbal communication? This is, after all, 90% of the message. Nonverbal communication does involve all the five senses. All types of nonverbal communication are important, but interpreting the meaning can cause problems. If we look at personal appearance, well, you can see that the college likes their students to appear white, crisp, clean. We want to give a message that our students are professional. They care about their appearance. They're sharp. That's the nonverbal message being given, hopefully, from the college to the hospital. Posture and gait are important holding yourself in a way that shows that you're competent, competent. You can use your posture and gait to express these things. Facial expression. We want to be aware of how our facial expression looks to others. So you might want to look in the mirror and do some teaching and see what your facial expressions look like. It would be interesting, well, when you watch yourself in SimLab, will be a good opportunity for you to observe your facial expressions. Eye contact. This is cultural, so we'll talk about it more. But eye contact at an appropriate level for situation and also cultural consideration. Gestures. Gestures is another cultural um, type of communication as well. There are some high gesture communities, low gesture communities, I think the Western culture, American culture is somewhere in between. You can also use sounds like sighs, you know. <sighs> that gives a message, doesn't it? We can look at territoria territoriality and personal space. Think about how close you are, if you don't, how close someone could come to you if you didn't know them, when you would start to feel uncomfortable. Where does your personal zone start? It starts at about 18 inches. So if you think about that, we go right into a patient's personal space. So we need to really use the most utmost. I mean, we need to be very respectful when we know that we're crossing into that personal space right away. This slide just goes more into what we were talking about, gives a few examples of nonverbal communication. If you look at these pictures, you can see that some nonverbal messages are being sent. If we look at the picture in the upper left hand corner, would we want to have a conversation with somebody who has this type of body language? Maybe not. However, maybe it's really cold outside. So it depends on the context. How about picture number two? The lady with a soft face. And the next one. They look quite inviting. I'd like to have a conversation with them. And what's the message of the two figures that we see on the far right side? It looks like they're connected. They're touching, maybe holding hands and walking. How about the picture in the lower left column? It looks like they're angry with each other, some type of argument going on. Ooh, the middle picture. It looks like he's angry. Not someone I'd want to interact with. Oh, another angry one right next to him. So we've got to think about what we're looking like when we interact with our patient. There's other forms of communi communication as well. 
Think about symbolic communication. This is using symbols. Even music is a part of symbolic communication. But if you look at these symbols that I have up here, they say a certain thing to us. Money, nurse, medicine, or something medical. Art is also a form of symbolic communication. Metacommunication sends messages that oftentimes present incongruence between the word and body language. So if you're looking at this broad term that refers to all the factors that influence communication, it means that we need to consider the environment that we're in, the people we're interacting with, as far as being appropriate in our communication with them. Awareness of the tone of the verbal response and nonverbal behavior warrants further exploration of the patient's feeling and concern. The nurse-patient relationship has four phases. You can further look in your text at box 24.4 on page 315 to get more information. But usually, first we have a pre-interaction phase. And this occurs, for example, when you guys go to prep. You find out information about the patient before you interact. This could happen during shift report. We might learn things about the patient, find out about their condition. We may further look in their chart after report to find out some laboratory values or maybe look at somebody's report before we go in for the orientation phase. When our, we're going to go in and, and meet the patient and we'll both get to know each other. We'll introduce ourselves by name and also our role in the hospital. In the working phase, this is when we get to accomplish our tasks. We work together towards goals, solve problems. So that's when the work of being together and moving towards health comes in. And then there should be a termination phase. It may be at the end of a shift or it may be at the end of a patient's stay where you kind of have closure. The same principles that guide one-on-one -on -one helping relationships apply when the patient is a family unit. Although communication with families requires additional understanding of the complexities of family dynamics, needs, and relationships, it's very important. In most cases in the hospital, it's not just the patient we're treating, it's also the family and the family has emotional needs, educational needs, just like the patient does. Evidence-based practices identified some of the nursing actions that increase the effectiveness of nurse-to-nurse -nurse interaction and in interprofessional communication. Please refer to box 24.5 in your textbook on page 316 and look at the box evidence-based practice. Communication within the community occurs through many channels. Examples of these are neighborhood newsletters, health fairs, public bulletin boards, newspapers, radio, television, and electronic information sites. Communication, and that is why we lift on three. All right, we have Roberto Ruiz, who is a 44-year-old man of Puerto Rican descent. He's suffering from HIV. AIDS. He was near death and in hospice, but his condition has improved and he is now home. Suzanne is a 54-year-old nurse dedicated to hospice and committed to maximizing quality of life and end-of-life care. What are some of the things that Suzanne could ask Roberto? Perhaps initially she would want to assess, what are your needs at this time? And what are your concerns at this time and for the future? So let's get an idea of where the patient is and where the patient wants to go. Helping relationships serve as the foundation of clinical nursing practice. Contracts for a therapeutic helping relationship are formed during the, and that would be A, the orientation stage, when you're getting to know each other. Maybe you're, the contract could be something informal where you let the patient know how long you'll be there, what your role is, and things like that. So that would occur during the orientation phase. If we look at these 
elements of professional communication, we'd like to stress the importance of professional appearance, demeanor, and behavior. These communicate that you have assumed a professional helping role, are clinically skilled, and are focused on your patient. There is something right now uh, evidence-based about um, the white coat. And it is interesting that I had an experience where I went into my father's doctor's office and his coat was absolutely filthy. And it was all I could do not to say anything, but I didn't want to, you know, harm the relationship with my dad and his physician. But professional appearance really does mean something. Um, that did not give me a positive impression of this doctor. Common courtesy is part of professional communication. Always introduce yourself. Failure to give your name and status or to acknowledge a patient creates uncertainty about the interaction and conveys an interpersonal lack of commitment or caring. I know for me, a lot of times my badge turns around. So I wanna make sure the patient knows who I am. I've been in the emergency room with my children and so many people come in and out of that room and I don't know who they are. So after the fourth or fifth person comes in and asks me the same questions, I'm done. You know, read the chart. You don't even have the courtesy to tell me who you are and what your role is and why, for the name of it, for the love of it, are you asking me the same questions I've just answered four or five times? It can get very frustrating. So we need to be aware of that in the healthcare setting. Trustworthiness includes maintaining confidentiality, doing what you say. If you said that you were going to come back and do something, do it. Nurses strengthen helping relationships by establishing trust, empathy, autonomy, confidentiality, and professional confidence. Competence. Autonomy is being self-directed to independent in accomplishing goals and advocating for others. And assertiveness allows you to express feelings and ideas without judging or hurting others. Some of you may be more shy than others right now in your first semester. As you go through the program, you'll get the opportunity to work on being assertive. As a nurse, we need to be able to speak up, be heard, be assertive for our clients, and it is an important skill to develop. All right, as Suzanne works with Roberto, she develops a helping relationship. Suzanne knows that posing questions for the patient's reflection helps her assess his needs and support his self-care strategies. A helping relationship between you and your patient does not just happen. You create it with care and skill and build it on the patient's trust as you and, a and you as a nurse. You help patients to clarify needs and goals, solve problems, and cope with situational and maturational crises. Creating this therapeutic environment depends on your ability to communicate, provide comfort, and help the patient meet his or her needs. If we look at types of communication in the clinical setting, you'll see that there could be medical communication where we're imparting medical, we're doing assessments, or actually I have assessment interviews as its own special category for a purpose down there, but that is a type of medical communication. There's also social communication. We may do some social interaction with our patients. And then there's a very special skill called therapeutic communication, and this is what you're going to get a, uh, an idea of and time to practice that during this class. This is a skill that you're being introduced to so that you can use it throughout second, third, and fourth semester. And when you get into fourth semester, you will be refining and honing the therapeutic communication skills in the, in the psychiatric setting. So process recordings is, is the tool, the evidence-based tool that you'll be using to develop these therapeutic communication skills. So you'll use them here in first, you'll use them again in geriatrics in third, and in the fourth semester, you'll be using them again in, in uh, psychiatric nursing. So um, the reason why I have assessment interviews as its own category is that when you do your therapeutic communication exercise called a process recording, you are not to turn in an assessment interview. So do not turn in anything that asks about a physical symptom and how um, it's affecting them, unless it's emotional. So therapeutic communication is about feelings. 
So if you're, the patient is having pain and you're asking them how they are coping with it mentally, that's therapeutic communication. But if you're asking them how they're managing it physically, like what medications they're taking, how bad is it on a scale of one to 10? What makes it worse? What makes it better? Those are things that are physical in nature. Therapeutic communication deals with things that are emotional in nature. So when you're doing your process recording, please do not turn in an assessment. Okay, so we're looking through the patient's eyes. There's something called empathy. If we're looking through the patient's eyes in an empathetic manner, we're gathering information from them and they're basically in the driver's seat and we're going to get in and go on a ride with them and see this situation through their eyes. Assessing contextual factors will help you make sound decisions during the communication process. Contextual factors includes your patient's physiologic status as well as relational situation, environment, and cultural context. See box 24-6 on page 317 and review assessment factors influencing communication. Remember that context refers to all the parts that help determine the meaning of something. When communicating with patients, it will be important to deal properly with your patient's physical, emotional, developmental, gender, and uh, sociocultural issues. Patients need to be treated respectfully with regards to age and culture. You can also review box 24-7 on page 318 that reviews focus on older adults, tips on improved communication with older adults who have hearing loss. Also, box 24-8, page 318, cultural aspects of care for tips on communicating with non-English speaking patients. So, cultural considerations, negotiating barriers. If we look at culture and communication, we want to look at the communication style. In American um, culture, how is our communication style? Well, it would be considered direct. For African American elders, it's important to address the client by Mr. or Miss or Mrs. In the Hispanic culture, it's considered uh, people are emotionally expressive. French and Italian cultures, for example, use a lot of hand gestures and lots of facial expressions. In Asian cultures, many people are stoic. They don't like to show the emotions on their face. As well as German and British, they also have very controlled expressions and are stoic. They do not want to present what's going on the inside emotionally with them on their face. If we look at eye contact, we may uh, think about how the lack of eye contact affects us in the American culture. We are a high eye contact society. And so if someone's not looking us in the eye, we may think, what? They're not listening. They're lying. They're not interested. So we want them to look them. We, you know, in our culture, we want someone to look us in the eye. Don't we tell our kids, look me in the eye when I'm talking to you. So we have to realize in other cultures where eye contact may be a, a lack of eye contact may be a sign of respect. We just have to consider it through cultural context. Perception of touch. We have to consider using touch with some people can be therapeutic. However, we have to be aware that some patients may have suffered sexual abuse or trauma and not want to be touched. Some people may feel paranoid and they should not be touched. So we should ask permission. Cultural filters can be a form of bias or prejudice. So we wanna look at our own cultural filters and be sure that um, we are open to others' viewpoints and learning. As nurses, we have to learn about other cultures. If you look at this table, you can kind of do this for yourself, but you can compare and contrast verbal and nonverbal communications with your own culture and other cultures. For example, in my culture, the communication style for Americans is Western, the eye contact, it's intermittent, but it's a high eye contact society. And touch, 
we do use touch, but not necessarily with strangers too much. We may shake a hand, but we don't embrace or kiss. So we can compare that to another culture where a communication style may be indirect. And let's say that we're um, looking at some Asian cultures where the communication is more indirect or round. Eye contact is low and touch is not appropriate you know, in the public domain, except it's the, they may do handshaking as well, but they may, um, for example, use a bow when they greet each other. Suzanne learns that Roberto wants to travel to New York to see his extended family. Even though Roberto is in poor health and the trip will be difficult, Suzanne expresses, has, expresses her understanding of the importance of the trip. She understands how important extended family is in the Puerto Rican culture. What is Suzanne demonstrating here? Her understanding of the importance of the extended family in the Puerto Rican culture helps her appreciate the importance of this trip to New York. Expressing an understanding of the importance of the trip, even though he is in poor health and it will be a difficult trip, demonstrates cultural sensitivity. In the example above, Suzanne did not question why he felt it important to see more distant relatives. Okay, if we look in our nursing process, our diagnosis, there would be many diagnoses appropriate for communication. So um, people may experience difficulty with communication for all of these reasons listed here. Remember that impairment of communication can be physiological, mechanical, anatomical, psychological, cultural, or developmental. The primary nursing diagnostic label used to describe a patient with limited or no ability to communicate verbally is impaired verbal communication. Although a patient's primary problem is impaired verbal communication, the associated difficulty in self-expression or altered communication pattern may contribute to other nursing diagnoses. So impaired verbal communication could cause things like anxiety, social isolation, ineffective coping, compromised family coping, powerlessness, impaired social interaction. Related factors for a nursing diagnose, diagnosis focus on the cause of the communication disorder. So for example, if it was something anatomical, like the person had surgery on their neck and mouth and were not able to form their words, it would be related to a type of anatomical issue. So impaired verbal communication Okay, with the definition and the potential stimuli. Okay, our goals and outcome. So we need those to be specific and measurable. So what are some examples of specific and measurable communication goals and outcomes? One could be patient initiates conversation about a diagnosis or healthcare problem. Patient is able to attend to appropriate stimuli. Patient conveys clear and understandable messages to the healthcare team. And patient expresses increased satisfaction with the communication process. And then we'd have to have our specific measurable outcome. Setting priorities, always maintain an open line of communication. This ensures that the patient is comfortable and that all physical needs have been met. Teamwork. If a patient is having problems with communication, you may need to seek the services of a speech therapist or an interpreter. So let's talk a little bit about therapeutic communication. So the goals of therapeutic communication is to have the patient feel understood, feel comfortable. We want to identify and explore problems relating to others. Maybe we want to discover healthy ways of meeting emotional needs experience satisfying interpersonal relationships. So if you look at those goals here, it's not to fix a problem, okay? It's an emotional experience. It's meeting a patient's emotional needs, not their physical needs. So therapeutic communication is meeting a patient's emotional need. Therapeutic communication techniques are specific responses that encourage the expression of feelings and ideas and convey acceptance and respect. In your syllabus, you have a table 
that lists all of the therapeutic communication techniques we want you to practice. Okay, so you're going to use these techniques when you do your process recordings. And they're going to go in column two. You're going to list them by name. And you're going to state the reason why you use them, the rationale. Okay. Um, active listening means being attentive to what the patient is saying, both verbally and non-verbally. So you're going to use that skill in your therapeutic interaction as well. Some things I want you to remember as you're interacting with your patient is the answer is not in you, okay? As a matter of fact, advice giving is a block to therapeutic communication. There's another table in your syllabus called blocks to therapeutic communication, and advice giving is a block, okay? A nurse can suggest some things, but we do not give an answer or our opinion to the patient. The answer is always inside the patient. Objective truth is never simple. We really don't know the ins and outs of everything that's going on with the client. So we really don't know the truth. Okay, so it's not our place to really give our opinion. Everything you hear is modified by the patient's filters and your own filters. Feeling confused or uncertain is okay. If you simply want to say, I don't know what to say to you right now, that's honest and that is okay. And then also listen to yourself too. Listen to your gut. What is your gut telling you? Active listening, as it says here on this slide, helps strengthen the patient's ability to use critical thinking to solve their own problem. By giving the patient undivided attention, the nurse communicates that a patient is not alone. Here's a technique, or here are some, I'm sorry, here are some techniques to show that you are practicing active listening. So we use the acronym SOLAR. S. Posture sitting conveys a message that you are there to listen and are interested in what the patient is saying. O. Observe an open posture. Keep arms and legs uncrossed. This posture suggests that you are open to what the patient says. A closed position conveys a defensive attitude, possibly provoking a similar response in the patient. L. Lean towards the patient. This posture conveys that you are involved and interested in the interaction. E, establish and maintain intermittent eye contact. This behavior conveys your involvement in and willingness to listen to what the patient is saying. Absence of eye contact or shifting the eyes gives a message that you are not interested in what the patient is saying. R, relax. It is important to communicate a sense of being relaxed and comfortable with the patient. Restlessness communicates to the patient lack of interest and a feeling of discomfort. During our visit, Roberto tells Suzanne, I really want to go visit my uncles in New York, but I'm not sure if I'm up for the trip. Suzanne is understanding. It sounds like you miss your family. Let's talk about your opinions for maintaining contact. I'm sorry, your options for maintaining contact. So Suzanne has used two therapeutic techniques there. She used, it sounds like you miss your family, which is called verbalizing the implied. And let's talk about your opinions for maintaining uh, options, I keep saying opinions, let's talk about your options for maintaining contact, and that's called exploring. As they talk, Suzanne helps Roberto to identify two methods of communicating with his family in New York. So outcomes, so those measurable outcomes that we could select would be, one, patient verbalizes two methods to maintain communication with family in New York, and two, patient verbalizes three concerns regarding his declining health. Attending behaviors. So more attending behaviors besides solar are maintaining eye contact or intermittent eye contact, controlling your vocal qualities, facing the person, using encouraging gestures, track verbal content, do not change the subject, use open-ended versus closed-ended questions. Now that I don't want to say that closed-ended questions are non-therapeutic. We don't want to give you that idea, but for somebody who is experiencing emotional problems, we want to try to use open-ended questions. However, if you need to get more information, sometimes then you go to the closed-ended questions to ask more specific um, lines of questioning. 
So a closed-ended question, of course, is when someone can say either a one-word answer, yes, no, type of a thing. Asking why. This is another thing that is a blocking technique in therapeutic communication. The rationale is that why implies right or wrong. So it may place a person on the defensive and cause discomfort. So now we've learned two blocks to communication. One is giving advice, and the second one is asking why. We have to think of another way to ask why without saying the word why. So it can be like, tell me the reasons you want to visit your uncles, or tell me more about your uncles. But instead of asking why, we need to figure out something else. Okay, so like I said, there's therapeutic communication techniques, and uh, we'll look at a few of those. There's non-therapeutic communication techniques, so those are called blocks. So those are both in your syllabus and the tables. And then there's something else that we can do, adapting communication techniques for patients with special needs. Unlike therapeutic communication techniques, non-therapeutic communication hinders or damages professional relationships, asking personal questions, giving personal opinions, changing the subject, automatic responses, false reassurance, sympathy, etc. Ineffective communication techniques are inhibiting and tend to block the other's personal willingness, willingness to openly express ideas, feelings, or concerns. Communication techniques often must be adapted for patients with special needs. Such, such patients include aging persons, those who have problems speaking and understanding, the hearing impaired, visually impaired, and those who do not speak English. You can see box 24-9 on page 324 for further information on communication with patients who have special needs. Here's a list of therapeutic communication techniques, and I'm not going to go through each one of them, but if you look at a few of those, sometimes, um, for example, a broad opening. So giving a broad opening, this is when the patient is allowed to take the lead. So an example of a broad opening statement is, what would you like to talk about today? So they pick the topic. You might make observations. Oh, I see that you're, you know, shaking your leg. Are you feeling, how are you feeling? Or maybe the person is feeling anxious, so you make an observation. You might actually just restate what the patient says, has just said to you, and that's something like, um, you know, my, my mom won't talk to me. And then you say back to them, your mom won't talk to you. So that is a therapeutic communication technique. Now, you don't have to memorize all of these before you go into a room. But I want you to go in and have a conversation, have a conversation about something of the, something about emotions or feelings. You're going to go in and have that type of conversation. And then you're going to, for your exercise, write down five things that you said to the patient with your nonverbal, your verbal and your nonverbal communication recorded. And then you're going to write down the five responses that the client gave you and their nonverbal communication. And then you're going to go back and look at the tables in your syllabus and see if you used a therapeutic technique or a blocking technique. And so that's how you start off on the therapeutic communication learning wheel. Okay, if you look at the next slide, there's a host of more techniques to use. Exploring is simply asking basically uh, a host of different questions that tell me about and usually exploring starts off with those three words tell me about tell me about how you're feeling about your stay here in the hospital okay um, presenting reality and voicing doubt those two are mostly probably used more in a psychiatric setting so you you won't have to worry about that um, let's see so, focusing sometimes if someone's really nervous they're gonna talk about you know six different things and you're going to just focus in on one of them. So I heard you say a lot of different things. Let's focus in on what you said about your sister-in-law yelling at you. Okay. So those are just some examples. If we look at the non-therapeutic techniques, we double go to the next slide. So like we said, giving advice, not therapeutic. Minimizing feelings, 
you know, everything, you know, you can say things like, um, it'll be okay. Don't worry about it. That's minimizing someone's feelings. Also, uh, we don't want to use uh, giving approval or agreeing. So we don't want to say, oh yeah, that's the right thing to do. I agree with you. Or no, I wouldn't do that. That sounds like a bad idea. Stay away from words like good or bad. If you feel like you need to use some type of what we say here, uh, a value judgment, stick with healthy and unhealthy. You might say things like, it sounds like you're making some healthy decision instead of saying, oh, those are great decisions. Yes, you should do that. Um, using cliches, try to stay away from cliches. Now, if the patient wants to use a cliche, you can support the cliche, but you don't give the cliche, like everything happens for a reason. Okay. So those are some examples there. Okay. This is for role playing in the classroom. So um, we'll save that for in class work. Okay. And this explains the what if. Okay. All right. Okay. Another one of the techniques you can use. Uh, as a therapeutic communication tool is they the person okay you can ask the person B what is the background what has been going on in your life how do you feel about that okay let me just point out what has been going on in your life this is a broad opening statement a affect affect means mood how do you feel about that that's exploring or actually I'm sorry I take it back it's all called encouraging evaluation Excuse me. P, trouble. What troubles you most about this situation? H, handling. How are you handling this? And E, empathy. That must be difficult. So that's five techniques you could use. And go ahead and do that. Put that in your process recording. And that's a good way to start. Okay. Another thing you could do is name the emotion. So we talked it seems as though the constant headaches really get you frustrated. So frustration is the emotion that the nurse is naming and the patient could agree or under, or, uh, the, per, the patient could agree or, clar or clarify that and tell you how they're feeling. Understand, I understand why you feel that way so you're empathizing with the patient. And then respect, you've been through a lot and that takes courage. Support, I wanna help you get better. So you can also nurse someone. Older adults with sensory, motor, or cognitive impairments require adaptation of communication techniques to compensate for their loss of function and special needs. So if we look at these things, if somebody has a cognitive impairment, they may not be able to, if they have dementia, they may not be able to respond to us appropriately. However, we still need to talk to them just like any other patient and tell them exactly what's going on. We don't want to ignore them, come in and do things without, um, introducing ourselves, telling them what we're going to do. So we, they're con they may be confused, so we really need to be careful with that. If someone has a hearing impairment, there's nothing more irritating uh, than not being able to hear. So if they don't have their hearing aids in, uh, that's going to be a problem. If they don't have their hearing aids at the hospital, that's going to be a problem. So if we can do anything to help them uh, obtain those and get those in before we're going to have communication with them, that would really help. If someone has visual impairment, so there may be some ways that we communicate with them. So for example, if, you know, just one simple example, if someone has a verbal impairment, you can, um, when they're eating, you know, explain things as if they're a, on a clock, you know, potatoes are two o'clock, something like that. Um, if the patient is unresponsive, same thing. We still talk to them as if they can understand everything we say. Patients who don't speak English, of course, we want to make sure that we have an appropriate interpreter. Okay, moving on to something new uh, in health informatics. We have e-health, e-medicine, telehealth. I don't know about you, but I just received some papers from my insurance, and I have signed up for the potential to have an e-visit with a doctor for things like ear infection, eye infection, colds, coughs. So uh, if I want to, I can just pay a copay and order up a consult on my computer. So we'll try it next time I need it. 
but essentially telehealth is the use of electronic information and telecommunication technologies that support long distance clinical health care, patient and professional health related education, public health and health administration. Technologies include video conferencing, the internet, store and forward imaging, streaming media, and terrestrial and wireless communication. So you can look up more at hrsa.gov about rural health. Um, it's big, you know, the big push was in, you know, uh, rural health because, you know, frankly, there wasn't enough providers in the rural areas to care for people. So telehealth probably came about because of this, but now it's, I think, being even used in urban areas uh, more and more. So I think we're going to see a lot of this and nursing probably is going to be involved or nursing is involved in this and will be continuing to be involved in this. So there will be roles for nurses in uh, telehealth, in medicine, in e-health. Telehealth can improve patients' experiences um, by, you know, if they're frail, elderly, and they can't get to the doctor's office, why they could just uh, have some monitors uh, on their iPhone and be able to get an EKG. So uh, sometimes even in dermatology, you can, you can look at a rash and get the history. Um, so they are using that. Both psychiatric and physiologic states can be evaluated and managed, monitoring vital signs, implanted devices, EKGs. For example, there's an app, iPhone app, that a person who has bipolar disorder can download on their phone. And the app can tell by voice changes if someone is entering a manic or a hypomanic state. And that can be um, used in conjunction with their psychotherapist to manage that condition. Uh, like I said, electronic house calls could be the wave of the future or even virtual health examination. Conferencing can occur from provider to patient and also provider to provider. So the, it would be nice to say, oh, gee, I need to talk to your um, kidney doctor. Let, let me just call him up on the phone here and have a conference with you the, do the consulting doctor, and um, so you can have the two doctors talk while you're right there as well. Okay. Oh, the other important point here is the last bullet point is that many mental health issues are not explored because of stigma. So if we can reduce stigma by people being able to consult in the privacy of their own home, that could be very beneficial. Also, it could be not only uh, stigma, but lack of being able to get there, lack of transportation, or just even lack of the ability to uh, cognitively, uh, because of cognitive issues, maybe not be able to get to the doctor's office. So there's a lot of solutions um, in this type of medicine. So I did talk a little bit about apps. Um, it's not a substitute for therapy, but it can be helpful as an adjunct. Uh, My Strength Now is an app that's recommended by a therapist. You need an access code from your mental health provider. But there's a lot of different types of apps. Like, for example, if you look up cognitive behavioral therapy that you're going to learn about in uh, my, my psych, uh, psychiatric nursing class, or you can look up something called dialectical behavioral therapy, you'll find a lot of different apps. Mood maps anything really. You're going to find so many things. There's saw uh, the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance has a wellness tracker, chat apps. The chat apps need to be thoroughly assessed before recommending and they may be used in coordination with the therapist. I think it's important for um, nurses, you know, to be able to look up these apps and see if they are appropriate because sometimes the patients might not be able to tell. So we're using Skype um, and now I see that reimbursement is becoming um, less of an issue, you know, because for sure my insurance company is now utilizing, promoting, and reimbursing for these telehealth conferences between provider and patient. While admitting a patient during the initial interview, a family member tells you, my mom really means that she does not understand her medical diagnosis. The communication form used by the family member is which one? So the, the family member is clarifying for the patient. Okay. Evaluation. Okay, so we want to look uh, through the patient's eyes. Does the patient perceive having difficulty communicating? Have the patient's needs been met? 
Videotaping practice sessions with peers or process recordings can help students assess their communication style. Desired outcomes for patients with impaired verbal communication include increased satisfaction with interpersonal interaction, the ability to send and receive clear messages, and attention to an accurate interpretation of verbal and nonverbal cues. So if you look on box 2410 on page 325, you can review further a sample communication analysis for an example of a process recording, although we have some here. Okay, so the process recording is an evidence-based tool to improve your therapeutic communication skill. You can document both verbal and nonverbal communication. There should be no blank areas on the form at all. Uh, you're going to document in the second column the technique used in the analysis. Was it therapeutic? Was it not therapeutic? If a block's identified, great. Don't worry about doing blocks. Doing, uh, having a block to communication is fine. That's the whole point of the process recording is to notice your blocks, put them down on the process recording, and then come up with an alternative statement. So if I don't see blocks, I don't really think you're doing this right. So try to find your blocks, try to process your blocks, try to catch your blocks. For sure, asking a why question, we all ask why. So those should be in your process recordings. Okay, remember to focus on the patient's thoughts, feelings, emotion, not physical symptom. The one thing, if you could summarize therapeutic communication in a nutshell, a nurse who's using therapeutic communication is neutral, 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 neutral. You're just a sounding board for the patient, okay? You're helping them feel understood. You're helping them feel accepted, but you are neutral in your opinion. Neutral, neutral, neutral. It's a powerful tool, okay? And it's a great skill to learn. Okay, uh, the homework that will be due is the process recording. Like I said before, it involves five sequential exchanges of messages, five comments by you, five answers from the patient. Exchange includes statement, response, and the analysis of interactions. So we'll look at that in the second column and fill in all the boxes, no blanks. If you look here, here is an example of a student's process recording. And so we talked about a broad opening statement, but in the first column here, you see the student wrote, Hi, my name is S, and I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be your sitter for the night. How are you? And the person said it's a broad opening statement, but actually it was just giving information. And how are you is kind of a social nicety. So um, the patient says, I'm not doing that great. I don't feel like I belong here. My roommate is so rude. Um, sorry, going back to the second uh, column, you see here that you, you write your communication technique, and then you say whether it was effective or not. And then the student also put the rationale down there. So that's perfect. The patient's verbal and nonverbal communication is addressed in the next column. And then you want to be always analyzing yourself, okay? So the student analyzed their own feelings during that interaction. Second column, tell me, remember I told you that's a good one for exploring. Tell me what concerns you about being on this particular unit. So that's an example of exploring that was effective and the rationale was given. The verbal and nonverbal of the patient was recorded, and then in the fourth column, the thoughts and feelings. Okay, continued on. My correction is in red. So I had crossed out the exploring and said it was encouraging evaluation. Now, don't worry, this is fine if you do this. You know, you use your best guess, and then I'll correct it if needed. But this is how we learn. So you go ahead and try. And um, then, you know, reevaluate it once you get your corrected process recording back. So if you could look at this, you can also see the examples continue. Okay. I think all elements are present. Okay, so you have several examples to look at. It must be really difficult. So we're empathizing with the patient. So there are other sample process recordings on the website. If you go to Los Angeles Harbor College website, you go to current students and look at Nursing 311, you can find more sample process recordings as 
well. Okay, communication skills conclusion. Understand communication process. You need, we need to understand the communication process and utilize the best approach to meet our clients' needs. If we reflect on our own communication experiences within the nurse's role, we will be able to improve our skills. We need to use critical thinking, overcome our own perceptual biases, and our human tendencies that interfere with accurate, accurately perceiving and interpreting messages. I thank you for listening, and I will see you in class.